Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and me and my squeaky office chair are very excited to welcome you back for a look at Piedmontese Italian tarot decks. Um, and we have a range, quite a date range for you today. Um, and I also have a special unboxing. So let me do the unboxing piece first and then we'll look at the uh, cards on the table. Um, this is another uh, instance where I'm comparing four different decks and I have a lot to say um, so it's going to be a long one I will put timestamps and all that good stuff so the first thing I wanted to talk about was this deck the Spanish tarot and uh, the Spanish or bilingual tarot and this was published by the company Fournier they are a Spanish um, card making group and they are still in business today you can still get a version of this deck um, today, I believe, although it sort of their print runs seem to sell out and so then they'll print more. Um, but this is a reproduction. It says uh, reproduction of a tarot from the year 1736 in the Museum Fournier in Victoria, Spain. And um, this was originally uh, published. This specific deck was originally published with the help and guidance of Stuart Kaplan. Um, it comes with several uh, leaflets, one of which is in Spanish and the other of which is all in English. So you can read the leaflet and it has Stuart Kaplan's sort of general esoteric um, take on the card meanings, but importantly it has this uh, paragraph in fine print at the top. Um, now when I was first looking at this box, I didn't bother to actually open the box or um, open the booklet and read for myself. So I was asking a friend of mine, Justin Michael, if he knew anything about this uh, deck and he's, he texted me back right away, said, oh yeah, it's by Otoni. It's, you know, it's from the state. And then I thought, oh, I should look at the little booklet. And sure enough, it has that information. So um, the historical information that is included here, it says the Spanish tarot fortune telling deck is reproduced through the courtesy of Museo Fournier, Victoria, Spain. The cards are based upon original woodcuts dating from the year 1736, first produced by Giuseppe Ottone in the village of Serravalle Cisia, uh, province of Vercelli, region of Ligaria Piemontese, Italy. Uh, the back of the Spanish tarot is an all over multiple floral pattern in diamonds with a geometric design, reproducing the same back of the original pack of 1736. The Fournier Museum contains quite an important quantity of ancient packs of playing cards as well as an interesting collection of ancient tarots. That is certainly true. I was able to go on the Museo Fournier website and actually find the entry for the historic pack that this um, deck is based on. Now unfortunately they don't have all of the cards up there, they only have a few, um, but there is an image and I'll link it down below. It's fairly um, simple, I would say. The, the art style is fairly, you know, of the period or even of the 1600s um, in a very kind of rough wood woodcut style. A lot of the colors are quite faded on the original cards and so what really stands out are the dark blues and the reds and it's kind of an unremarkable deck I mean compared to other Marseille of the time period that are either better preserved or have like a more refined art style or something it's not that interesting um, but I have seen a lot of people reviewing and talking about this deck the the one that it's you know the, the more modern uh successor um, online and I really wanted to get a copy because I love how beautiful it is and I like also just to have decks from different time periods in different regions so I don't have a lot of Marseille decks because to my eye um, for example a lot of them look very very similar and I'm not quite into the minutia but um, this is the only example of the Ottoni that I know of that is still available today so I think it's cool that there's a modern reproduction. Now something funny happened, um, and I talked about this in my uh, video on kind of Jack Japanese auction shopping, um, which is that I accidentally bought a sealed pack of cards. So this still has the shrink wrap on it, but I'm going to unwrap it today because I wanted to do this video. And I do technically own another copy of this, but it's in the UK and I don't have access to it. 
um, in my enthusiasm in 2020 to get a copy of this deck. I found one for a fairly reasonable price on UK eBay, but the shipping was more than the cost of the deck. And so I had it shipped to some local friends uh, there, um, figuring that I was going to be going over there um, later that year and I could just get the deck when I went to visit them. And of course, travel plans had to get cancelled, uh, so it's just been sitting in the UK. They still have it and I'll get it eventually, but in the meantime I'm going to go ahead and open this pack um, because I want to do this walkthrough with you. <laughs> So I will do that off camera um, to avoid the crinkling and I'll meet you down on the table in just a second. All right, shrink wrap is off successfully. And here we are with our four decks we're gonna be comparing today. So let's go through these. So here we have that Spanish tarot that I just unwrapped. Again, it comes in this two-part box originally. Um, and Fournier does produce a version of this in a, a darker colored box, kind of a burgundy colored box now. Same deck, colors are a little bit different. Um, like I said, it comes with um, a couple of different booklets. Uh, this one, and then one in Spanish. And uh, when I unwrapped mine from the cellophane, it actually came with this little number inside too. I don't know if that's like a serial number or an inspection number or something, but that was a cool little like, oh, what's this? Um, so that was neat. Uh, these are the backs of the cards and they are based on the original. So the Otone deck has these same backs, which you can see here. Not very interesting, but um, historically accurate, I guess. But it's funny to me because the colors really don't match um, the original deck at all. Uh, they're very bright and saturated, and so that's a huge difference between this and then the historic one. Um, but the reason I got this was for the colors, so no complaints there. Uh, this one does come with a title card that you can see here, and it also comes with an information card, which I've put at the end of the deck. Next up, we have the Taroki Vergnano, and this comes from one of my favorite card producers, Mr. Giordano Berti. I will put the link to this deck. You can get it on Etsy, um, so I'll put that down below. And he produces these lovely decks. You can get it in a simplified box. I like these book style boxes. This is like the slightly fancier version of what he produces and then the cards come in here it's all lined in velvet you get a personalized note and you get a little booklet relating to the deck that you buy so here we have a booklet all about this particular deck because there's some good history on this deck so like i said the vergnano is um, published uh, originally in 1830 in the kingdom of sardinia in turin or torino as the italians call that city these are the backs. I don't know um, how historically accurate they are. I assume they are because um, Mr. Bertie's other decks are. And again, it comes with an information card and a signed and numbered um, authentication at the bottom. Next up, we have the Taroki Perrin. And my copy is one that I picked up um, for cheap off eBay. I just happened to be browsing around for something else. I can't remember if I was searching for this deck or um, just older historic tarots in general. This had kind of been on my radar because um, Giordano Berti also produces a version of this deck, but because of the print quality of the original source material being kind of poor quality, I didn't want to spend a deluxe amount of money for a deck that isn't it doesn't have very clear images, and that's not Mr. Bertie's fault. Again, it's the original deck that looks like this. You can see it sort of looks like um, newsprint, newspaper print, uh, where the plates for the different colors are not quite perfectly aligned, and so some of the images come out kind of blurry. Um, the whole deck is kind of like this. So um, I was lucky enough to find this um, more cheaply produced deck. I think this came out sometime in the 90s originally, but someone on eBay had like four or five copies of it as a uh, new old stock that they were selling, so unopened old stock. The box is a little crushed because the box is too big for the cards. So, you know, production quality is you get what you pay for. I paid about 10 euros for this, so it was not expensive. Um, Alberto Peruzzo is the uh, publisher of this version of the Taroki Perrin. And it's interesting because he dates this to 1880, Whereas Giordano Berti uh, published, 
published his deck and dates it to 1865. So I'll leave a link to Mr. Berti's uh, version in case you do want to pick up a copy of this, um, since this edition is currently out of print. And I doubt we'll come back in print. Um, it's a very Bones kind of production. You get uh, this sort of a tuck box, and then you don't get any kind of booklet or title card or anything inside. These are the backs, and that is our full card for this one. And this deck is a uh, Piedmontese deck because it's published in an area of the Piedmont region of Italy, but it actually has more of a Milanese kind of flavor. So I will also be comparing certain cards with our Chirocco Soprofino. This is a very classic late period um, Mil Milanese deck and the etching uh, and the engraving on this are absolutely superb. Uh, my reproduction copy is produced by Los Scarabeo. This is their Anima Antiqua series. And I was thinking about doing just a side-by-side -side of this and the um, Perrin, but because the Perrin technically is a, from the Piedmont region, and this is a different region of Italy, although neighboring and very nearby, I decided to include the Perrin here so we can compare and contrast. I'm going to also be pulling a few cards from the Soprofino here and there to kind of add that into the comparison. And finally, we have the Nuovo Tarocco Ligare Piemontese, uh, designed by Matteo Guarnasia, um, who is a modern day artist. This was produced in Milan in 18, 1982, so technically produced outside of Piedmont, but it has a lot of Piedmont, Piedmontese characteristics. Um, and including the fact that the artist attributes it to the Piedmontese style. Um, but it has modern tarot elements in it too, so it'll be interesting to compare and contrast this modern interpretation of a Piedmont deck with some of these other ones. Um, the production is kind of interesting. This is a highly textured kind of craft paper or paper mache uh, type of box. I guess it's like wrapped in this textured paper, but you can actually feel this latticework design on the box. It has a title card, and it actually comes with two title cards, so two copies, same card. One is glued to the front of the box, and the other um, goes with the deck. Those are the backs. It's got this, um, you know, space kind of theme, or night sky type of theme to it. It does not come with a booklet or any kind of instructions, so you know, that's pretty typical people who um, live in a, you know, people who are from a culture that invented tarot and distributes tarot, you know, they, they just assume that people know what tarot is and how to use it or what they might want to use it for. So no instructions there. I believe that Nuovo is independently produced by the artist, but it's funny because it is mentioned in this Japanese, uh, the, the booklet for this Japanese deck that I got and did an extensive video on last week, if you missed that. Um, you may not, I'm not sure if everyone who's watching these historic videos is also interested in my Japanese series. So if you missed it, um, just briefly, this deck is featured in the booklet for this um, very strange Japanese deck called the Tarot of Wicca. And um, this was actually co-produced between uh, Alexandria Jupiter King and Stuart Kaplan of U.S. Games. You can see it says U.S. Games on the back. So the booklet uh, shows a lot of different tarots that were being produced around this time in the early 80s. And it has an image of the Justice card from this deck in the booklet. So I just thought that was like a weird coincidence because I didn't know about this tarot from the Tarot of Wicca, I just saw that overlap when I was looking through the booklet. So clear, clearly Stuart Kaplan knew about this deck and he was involved in the production of this deck. He's all over the place. All right, um, so those are the decks we're going to be comparing. I do have an odd card here or there that I'll also um, draw in for comparison. And I did want to give a shout out to some fellow researchers um, before we get started with the flip through. And a couple of those are YouTube channels. So Justin Michael, who I mentioned before, has been having um, a love affair with Italian tarots himself, and he's produced a couple of 
different videos on different styles of Italian tarot that he's collected. I encourage you to check those out and I'll link his channel below. And the other is Marilyn from Tarot Clarity. Um, she's also done a number of different videos on historic tarots, including um, Piedmontese style, as well as neighboring regions around Italy. Um, so I'll link her channel. I'm also going to link a blog post by um, Cheryl Smith. She is really my go-to resource for anything about historic variants and what sets variants apart from each other. And I can't recommend her blog enough. She does thorough research. She has been doing thorough research for uh, a long time and she's very knowledgeable. So um, thank you, Cheryl, for all your information. I really appreciate it and for kind of letting us YouTubers crib off of your homework. <laughs> it's very nice. Um, so I will link to her, her website as well. I also found some information of, about Piedmontese Tarot from the International Playing Card Society website, and so I'll link to one of their specific pages that shows um, other examples and names of other decks that I don't have access to um, there. So if you want to look into additional examples of this style of tarot, you can check that as, out as well. Um, in addition to that, I've got links, like I said, to Mr. Bertie's um, Etsy shop where you can buy his tarot decks. I'll also link to um, the artist's website, Matteo Guarnasia. Um, he uh, was born in 1954 and he's still alive today. So he's in his late 60s. He's still producing art and he's an interesting character. So you can check him out as well. So um, I think that's all our preliminary rambling. Let's go ahead and start flipping some cards over and I will talk our way through this um, probably at great length. So starting with the Fool, um, this is one of the characteristic cards that I've learned to identify um, Piedmontese style decks. And three out of the four here um, show one of the big characteristics, which is very baggy or puffy pants on the Fool. So you have this um, exaggerated, loose fitting clothing here on the pants. Um, here it's not that way. It's more of a tight fitting pair of hose, but you do get that kind of extra fabric with this almost skirt around the jester form um, in the Peren deck. Another um, element that's only on two of these is a butterfly. So that's another uh, Piemontese trait. Um, you can see that in this card, the um, the Nuovo, the, uh, there's like a mix here between, I would say, um, RWS imagery uh, with the cliff there and um, the rose in the hand, the, the white rose in the hand. We don't see that in any of the other decks. So that's from the RWS, but then you get the butterfly and the butterfly and the baggy pants are um, a characteristic of the Piedmontese. So it's kind of a mashup. This card that I just put out also has a butterfly and also has the Pamela Coleman Smith type of fool. This is from the JK Waite deck out of Japan. So um, very interesting to see these different elements kind of mixed together in this Nuovo Tarot. Here we have our magician. And um, we have different implements on the table than we see in some French style decks. So each of these fe uh, features a different range of objects here. Um, this looks more like cobbler's type tools to me. And we have a cobbler, uh, definitely a cobbler here in the um, Peren uh, for sure. This one seems to be more of that magic trick kind of um, set up here with balls and dice and coins and and knives and this one I can't quite tell you've got knives and you've got some other things that I can't quite identify on the table there so that's interesting the um, Soprafino also shows uh, someone with definitely cobbler type uh, implements on the table so pinchers um, you've even got a um, like a model of a foot here um, or stretching device for stretching out shoes and um, yeah other devices for like working leather punching holes in leather in order to sew it and that kind of stuff so definitely um, and this work apron here definitely the, the magician or the bagato uh, being more of a cobbler type okay 
We have card number two, La Sacradotia, or High Priestess. Uh, you can tell Stuart Kaplan's got his fingers in this one because of the titles on the cards. He seems to always put the RWS type titles on um, the decks that he works with, even if they're not RWS type decks. Uh, we have more traditional labels here, La Papesa. Here in the Nuovo, it's really a mashup between this kind of imagery and label with the RWS um, type of imagery as well. So she still has a book um, in her lap, not a scroll, right? She's got a tome. Um, it's not open, but she, then she has all this Egyptian jazz going on. So she's got um, this bird uh, style headpiece with a crescent moon, which is reminiscent of our uh, tr triple moon goddess um, headpiece on our RWS High Priestess. She has this um, different kind of cross here and these earrings that look like Egyptian pyramids and then this funky headdress over top. So it's really a mix of different imagery um, with her pillars back here and um, then her gown and her book look more like this style. A little more traditional for our Empress even in our Nuovo. Um, she's got some nice 80s shoulder pads and puffy sleeves fashions going on but basically everybody looks like you know the queen of some place. And here we have our Emperor, and right away you know I'm going to point out the tulip-shaped scepter for our Emperor here on our um, Peren card, just because I love that. Um, our Superfino also has an, a tulip-shaped scepter, although his has sort of an eagle perched on top of it, um, so that's a little, a little different. Um, but very similar here. Um, with the with an eagle sculpture making up the wing um, or the armrest of his throne. So that's here as well. Um, here you get a slightly different configuration with the armrest. Um, it's it's reminiscent of this, but it's not exactly the same. And then over here, just much more plain um, and you know more traditional or more Marseille like with the type of um, scepter that they're holding with the type of crown that they have and all of that. And here we have our Pope. Um, now here he's called El Sumo Sacerdote. Uh, I guess that means like Supreme Priest or something. Um, here it's the High Priest and so it's not the Hierophant, uh, interestingly. I guess Stuart Kaplan kind of modified his language to fit in with High, high Priestess, High Priest. Um, here we have uh, the Pope, and this is pretty traditional, although I did want to point out that both of these guys have interesting implements. This one has something that looks to me like a shepherd's crook. Um, I don't know for sure, but uh, you might think of a shepherd's crook as being that thing that has just a curved top. Um, you can also get, so that would be a neck crook for, for um, restraining an animal around the neck or grabbing an animal by the neck. Um, but there's also a foot crook that's a lot um, more narrow and skinny. And that's kind of what this looks like to me. It would be to grab a, to grab a hoof or a leg as an animal's trying to get away from you. Um, here he's got a, a flower um, and it sort of looks like a tulip. Um, so a tulip shaped topper on his staff. And then here he's got the tri, the, the tri cross, the triple cross, and also here with the triple cross. So this is um, a more traditional uh, Pope card in the Nuovo than in some other cards and choices that he's made. I do like our sideways um, Benedictine uh, Pope in the Peren. And here we have our lover's card, and it is labeled the same way in each, uh, different variations based on the uh, language, but it all translates into the lovers. And they're all fairly um, traditional and consistent, um, at least these three are, with an older Italian or Terra de Marseille um, kind of depiction. Here we're missing our cherub, so we don't have that, but we do have a flying heart over the two people, and we also don't have a third party here, so we just have the couple. And here for our chariot card, my card of the year for this year, um, we have such an interesting mix. Um, I just love the colors, the bright colors in the Spanish tarot. It's really cool. I'll even forgive the orange faces in this case because they're all orange, so it's not a printing error. It's just like 
a color choice, right? They're all this sort of neon color. Um, and this is really funny. Uh, the the horses are staring at each other with these kind of like woo eyes, and then they almost seem like a push, push me pull you like two halves of one creature. I think the implication here is that the back part of the horses is like underneath the blanket and that they're somehow joined here to the chariot, but it's the horse perspective is really weird. Um, this one makes a little bit more sense. Each horse has its own blanket and then we've got our charioteer back here and then the same thing here, uh, much more realistic in our more modern printing. I do notice that these epaulets um, here harken back more to the Terra de Marseille type of card as they do here. So you get a frowning uh, and smiling face on the shoulders there. And here we have Justice, and some have wings, and some have chairs. So this is very obviously a chair. And she reminds me of an RWS um, style with this uh, circular thing in the top of her headpiece. Um, this Justice clearly has wings. And then here it's sort of ambig ambiguous, and I think this is um, this style of art that you see in the Terra de Marseille is where the idea of wings comes from. I think it's meant to be a curved back chair, but because you can't quite tell, and it sort of looks like uh, the curved tops of wings that later artists interpreted that in that way. Absolutely outstanding hermit cards all the way around. Uh, really love the deep purple here, and this card almost looks purplish too. Yeah, it's this part is blue in here, and then this part is definitely purple, so really beautiful on our Vergnano. I love the color choices. I love his elaborate sort of habit back here. It's got like a hood and then maybe um, kind of a stocking cap thing coming down his back, and it's all different colors. We've got Lantern, Lantern, um, kind of a wick lamp, and this uh, hermit is very similar, again, to the Soprafino. So here's our Soprafino hermit with his little wick, wick style lamp and his beard. This guy is a ginger, and this guy has gray hair, um, but very similarly dressed, similar foliage, sandals, uh, brown cloak, etc. So um, possibly influence there, or just consistency of historic style. And then this guy's uh, different, and he's in a desert with cacti, um, modern cacti. And I don't know if these kind of cacti grow in Italy, um, or if this is a nod to American um, type of cactus. It looks like prickly pear cactus to me. Um, but again, we do have an older guy. He's got a turban on, he's holding a lantern, and he's got a big shaggy beard. Interesting choices here for our Wheels of Fortune. We have mostly uh, eight-spoked wheels, which is my preference. Um, these two have an eight-spoked wheel, and uh, being a student of Buddhism, I, I can't quite call myself a Buddhist yet, uh, but it, it to me it reminds me of the Eightfold Path, specifically this kind of design here, so I love that. Uh, this one has six spokes, and this one I got a little confused, but if you, this is the axle here, and then you have six and six, so different numbers there. Almost all of them have kind of a ambiguously um, winged item at the top, um, or creature at the top. Not really sure exactly what those are. This could be fortune, I suppose. It's it's more humanoid and it has a crown and um, possibly wings with some creatures going around the wheel here. Um, this is definitely a creature with other creatures around it. And then here we just have Lady Fortune herself. Um, she's got a cornucopia spilling coins down this side and then lightning bolts in her hand over here and then a flaming torch on the wheel itself. So very different style here than the other three. And here we have our classic strength or force. Um, this would be very Terra de Marseille kind of style with this hat um, and the way the pose that she's holding the lion in. Uh, this lion looks very Chinese. When I did my walkthrough a couple of weeks ago of the Terra de Basin San um, and the Miller in particular, um, which is also produced by Giordano Berti, um, I pointed out that that deck has some Chinese influences, and this one does too, for sure. So this looks more ch like a Chinese lion with the, the way the curls are um, and this claw coming out. So that's interesting. Um, we have a different style of headgear here on our strength character. 
Um, she looks more Italian to me, more Southern Italian almost. And then we have La Forza here. And, you know, again, a lot of traditional um, imagery here, but just a different kind of a pose. And she does not have the hat or crown on. And here we have some different kinds of poses for our hanged man. Um, we have a leg cross behind and the arms out. Um, also the tongue out, if you can see that. So that, again, suggests um, dying, essentially. Um, this uh, hanged man and this one look similar in terms of their facial features, um, but this guy's not crossing his uh, feet. So actually both look like they're tied up one behind the other, both attached to the tree. And then this guy definitely has um, been up there for a while. He's got flies buzzing around, so I don't, I don't think he's alive. <laughs> In each of our number 13 cards, um, only two of which have labels uh, here, uh, we have a skeleton, um, our typical Grim Reaper type. Um, although this guy does not have a scythe, he's just sort of hunched over uh, looking at these um, body parts here. I love the addition of a of raven or crow here, um, a carrion bird, and also um, it brings to mind Edgar Allan Poe, of course. Um, but everybody else is pretty similar. Uh, lots of um, things in the foreground, heads, limbs, bones, all kinds of stuff. And especially here in the paren, we also um, don't get a lot of bones per se. I think there might be one or two, but it's mostly the implements representing the kinds of people who are dead. So we have a book, we have a crown, we have an artist's palette. Um, we have all these different kinds of implements to suggest, you know, different um, walks of life or different careers. And then the same thing for the Soprofino. So clearly some influence here between these two um, or drawing from common influence. We have a book. Um, we have a sword, which I can see here. We have an encrusted... Um, you know, treasure of some kind, some kind of gold, an artist palette. So yeah, very, very similar there. These just have different kinds of bones um, and hands, although this one does have a crown and some other knickknacks down at the bottom. Oh, and there's a book, so that's interesting. So it's like body parts only, a mix, and then only stuff to represent uh, the people who are dead. So here we have our temperance cards. One thing I didn't point out before, but I will now, is that the two decks in the middle, the Vergnano and the Perin, use the Arabic numbers, and then the two others use Roman numerals on the majors. Um, but these are both pretty traditional, I would say. This one a little bit less so. She doesn't have wings. She doesn't have um, any kind of headdress or headgear. And then this one completely breaks the mold when uh, we go with a Hawaiian theme. Um, so she's got a lei. Um, she's clearly not European uh, to my eye. And uh, long black hair and this um, tropical flower in her hair. And then a tropical setting behind her with this grass and this sort of... Um, grotto or something like that. And her devil card. Now again the two decks on the left, the Spanish tarot um, and the uh, Vergnano have uh, a traditional Marseille type devil with the little fawn ears or uh, antlers coming out of the head or hat. We have multiple faces in the body. We have breasts on the devil. Um, here we have eyes in the knees, which I, I like. Um, and the two imps. Here we have two imps, but we have a devil kind of slouching uh, on a lounge chair made of fire with a trident. And here we have a very Baphomet-like character. Um, and so this one's not RWS. It's sort of Marseille in the way that you have the two imps on the plinth, um, kind of like this. But this character itself is uh, very much more pagan or, or Baphomet um, type uh, devil. And then here in our tower card, um, this is the only one that has the sun 
or any kind of celestial body in it. We do see lightning coming. Uh, maybe there's a hint of a sun there, but it's hard to tell with the quality of the printing. And then this is just lightning coming down. Um, this poor guy has a brick coming towards his head or landing on his head. This guy's got a big slab of the building uh, already on him and his compatriots being flung free. These guys are on their way down and then we have two figures here as well. Um, I do like how this lightning bolt looks like a giant leaf exploding out of the tower. So I would, you know, probably read each of these in a very different way um, if I were going to do readings with these decks. All right, some variation in our star cards here. Um, we have the Spanish Tarot, the Bergnano um, is also quite traditional and very similar to a Marseille style, although this body is constructed in a very strange way. Um, I'm not sure the woodcarver was quite up to uh, the task um, to, to represent a nude female, so <laughs> uh, it's just her torso looks huge in comparison um, and her upper arms look huge in comparison to everything else. Uh, it's very weird. Here we have a much more proportional and visually pleasing uh, star character as well as uh, here too. And I did want to take a quick peek at the um, Soprafino just to compare. So yeah, the Soprafino is quite different actually. And it's not really like any of these. So we have an owl with stars in the sky behind her. She's still pouring water into a pond, but she's not like that one. Um, maybe she's more traditional. Uh, to these two, but that owl is just very different. And then this one does remind me of the RWS, although you know you can see you can see similarities between all three, but this one kind of reminds me of the RWS for some reason. Here we have our moon card, and again you can see that um, these are different uh, styles of Tarot de Marseille type 1 and type 2, um, we would call these, uh, or you would say Italian maybe type 1 and type 2 that are similar to the Marseille, uh, depending on whether the moon is facing you or the opposite, of, or facing the side. I can't remember actually which one is which, um, but some variation there. Uh, then we have this one, which sort of reminds me of the RWS more than anything else, although it's weird because um, you don't have the path. So this is more like a fountain um, than an actual natural body of water. It looks like a constructed um, edge here. And, you know, maybe it's an outdoor lobster tank. I don't know, <laughs> but that's what it looks like to me. But the moon looks very similar um, to this one. And then here in the Peren, we can also draw a big comparison between that and the Soprafino. So same poses with the two dogs. We've got a silver dish with a lobster on it. Um, the moon is surrounded by clouds. We have this lighthouse or tower scene in the background, ships on the water. Um, so very different from this more traditional style, but very similar to each other. All right, here are our sun cards. And again, fairly traditional in um, the first two decks. This one, uh, I'm gonna compare to the Soprafino in just a second, but this one I wanted to compare to the RWS. So you can see some similarities. Um, you have the two figures, right? Two figures, nobody's on a horse. Um, we have a bread brick wall here, but then we have the addition of sunflowers. And I am sure, um, that our artist here probably saw this card and used that for some of the inspiration. We also get the alternating kind of straight lines back here and then these squiggly lines sort of harken back to this, although they're not exactly the same. So there's that one. And then if we compare the Soprafino with our Perrin, uh, we have a sun over two lovers. Um, and, he, you know, here he's in uniform, here not so much, um, but a scene behind them, they seem to be in a walled garden with a scene behind them. I do like the addition of this face up here, and I don't know if you can tell, but this is a, a traditional clay pipe that um, workers would have smoked out of. They were kind of disposable items. Um, you would wear you would wear down the stem of your clay pipe and then you would throw it away or until it cracked or something and just go get a new one. They were very cheap. And so these white clay pipes um, are still found 
in the Thames River in England is one place, and you can just um, walk along the Thames and find them. So um, that's how that's how uh, prevalent they were. So I think it's really funny that we have the sun smoking a clay pipe. For card number 20, we have another example of a difference in label. So here we have judgment and judgment uh, over here. And then we have the angel for the middle two cards. So that's an interesting uh, difference there, at least interesting to me. All depicting a similar scene across the board. We have our angel with the trumpet coming out of a cloud um, and figures rising up from the bottom. And we have our world card. Now this deck reminds me, I think it's the Dodal that has a more gender ambiguous um, or hermaphroditic type of figure in the center. Um, this one, actually all three of these are more of a more modern or more feminine take on that central figure. And I would say in particular, um, the Nuovo, once again, really pulls from our RWS card. Um, her proportions, um, her stance, uh, even her hair um, just look very much like this card to me. And onto our batons, we'll be able to go a little bit faster now. Um, but all three of these showing a chopped off um, type of baton. You don't see the top of this one, but it all looks chopped off, as opposed to that rounded um, Italian club style that you get in other decks. So here uh, we can see that the um, pip cards in our Nuovo, this deck, um, are a lot less decorated than in our other decks and uh, they have this club-like feature for our clubs, for our bastoni or batons. Um, and I've seen this style of kind of, you know, it's a log style um, in other Italian decks, but I can't think of what they are off the top of my head. So if you remember, feel free to leave a comment below. Um, all of the fours say La Milano on them. Um, but yeah, there, our three decks on the left have different colors of wands, and I like all of them. I do like the mix of colors on our Peren here. Uh, that's very nice and lively. And then I just love the different uh, color choices here in the Spanish tarot. I do love getting away from the yellow, red, and blue um, from some of the more traditional Marseille type decks. Um, as I've said before, I find that some different color choices really help me stay engaged with my cards and liven up my readings. Also interestingly that the Peren here has um, both Roman and Arabic numerals on it, and then our Nuovo just has a label, um, a spelled out label at the bottom. Our page of batons looking very different from each other, actually. The first two decks, pretty, pretty similar. Uh, similar hat, even, just kind of slouchy hat. This one has a tassel on it. But then this guy looks much more um, modern and much more I don't know, Venetian or something with the stripes. Um, he looks like he's about to go out to a fancy dress party. This guy looks like he's about to go club something over the head and drag it back to his caveman cave. Oh, the colors are so good. So good. So, wow, look at that fuchsia or magenta color. Just love it. Yeah, really nice. I also love the faces in the Spanish tarot. They look sarcastic, they look engaged, they look um, curious. I think it could be a really great reading deck, so I'm looking forward to reading with it um, now that I've taken it out of the plastic. Um, here we have our Cavalier of Batons, and again, uh, dressed similarly to the page, this guy is a centaur, and again, struggling with that big club or figuring out what to do with it. All pretty similar again, except for this lady who, again, she looks like an Amazon or something. Like she's really going to put that club to work. And finally, our king. And 
we can't tell where these two kings are located, whether they're indoors or outdoors, uh, really. Um, this guy's clearly indoors. He's got a big marble um, plinth and column behind him. And then this guy's clearly outdoors. So um, yeah, love a, love a king outside. Checking out his kingdom. I also like his hair. It's gray and it's in these uh, elaborate coils. For our Ace of Cups, I see a range of influences across the board here. Um, this is a very Marseille style cup with this sort of, I call it like a castle or cuckoo clock shape, these uh, pillars and all of these straight lines. Here we have an Italian style cup filled with fresh flowers. Here we have a nice rounded lidded cup. This is much more Swiss. And then here we have an overflowing fountain of a cup that I guess you could compare to the RWS with that water flowing over the side. Um, but the handshake at the top is very interesting. Kind of reminds me of the Two of Cups. Again, very plain pips on the Nuovo, although these um, cups are really elaborately decorated in color and, and they're very pretty. We have an identifier here on the Vergnano, but not on the uh, any of the others. And we notice a similar shape between the cups once we get into the um, lower numbers of the pips. All of them have this open um, vessel kind of shape that I equate with an Italian style. They're not really rounded at the top like a Swiss one. Um, and they're not closed, so they're all they're all fairly similar. Gosh, this blue! I tell you what, that stands out so much in person. I don't know if the camera's really picking that up. It's amazing, all the different colors you've got. Dark orange, light orange, green, dark green, olive, lavender, purple. So that's what, six colors? It's so nice. I love the Spanish tarot pips because it's just so interesting and beautiful, fun to work with. Foliage on the left two decks, but nothing on the right two. And then different patterns, of course, in our Nuovo. We did not go traditional. To our court cards. And again, the left three have more in common with each other. And here we have a um, Page of Cups drinking uh, out of his vessel. And I mentioned this also in the uh, Miller, um, in our in my Besançon video. And this even goes back to the Budapest Tarot where you have a page of cups guzzling um, from a cup. Just love these colors are so beautiful. So beautiful. I like our closer queen here. You can really get a sense of her um, rather than being further away. And she doesn't have a crown on. Um, so she's just in her garden enjoying her wine. Our king. Similar energy, although again, I like that we have a setting and that he's outside. Our swords. Now, before I sat down to record this video, I was putting my cards in order, and I noticed these kind of yod looking things. And it reminded me of the RWS with the yods. And I thought, ooh, okay, this is clearly drawn from this, right? Doodads. But then you look over here. <laughs> So this deck from 1830 has the little yod squiggly things. And then if I look here, 
they're they're here as well. And I don't know if those were added on. I don't have a picture of the original that the Spanish tarot was based on. So really three out of four have the little squiggles on the Ace of Swords, which is interesting and I don't really know much to make of it. love the purple and the blue on the swords of the Spanish tarot. Absolutely gorgeous. So I have a respect for the ancient tarots and, you know, learning the history and all of that, but when it comes to actually reading with decks, I just prefer modern decks because the printing quality is better, you can get a lot more fine detail, and you can use really cool colors. Like, look at this. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, this five has the uh, museum stamp on it, and I assume that's to recreate the um, one off of the original card. And here's a great example of the facial expressions on our Spanish tarot. Look how, look how sort of cheeky he looks. Look uh, how, you know, sneaky um, or suspicious or up to, you know, maybe he's going to play a prank on somebody or something. Yeah. And he's probably doing what somebody who's younger would do when they first got a sword, which is wave it around haphazardly. <laughs> Here's a little bit more of that Chinese influence I was telling you about, the heavy mustache and the way the face is drawn um, here, and even the style of mail that he's wearing, um, it just, it all sort of hints at that um, Chinese influence. This guy's interesting, he's got uh, one of those masks that opens, or helmets that opens on one side. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. He looks like he's going to joust. Queens. Here our Perrin is different. Um, she's got a cushion under her feet and again more swag and drapery around her. And then this queen, she just looks decked out. Um, she's got a very fancy embroidered outfit on, a fur stole, this crazy hat with pearls all over it. I think I'm going to forever call this the Steve card because um, it looks like my friend Steve. He's got a big long red beard like that. Um, yeah, so that's funny. Um, this guy, yeah, he's got the ermine stole and then a Swiss. I don't know. Maybe that's some region in Italy that I'm not familiar with, but it looks like a Swiss shield. Um, and then these two guys are more of that Terra de Marseille kind of older Italian uh, traditional style. All right, lastly, we have our coins, or denari, as they're known. Um, this, I have a feeling, was left open in order to put a stamp, a tax stamp, in the middle. Uh, here we have a credit. It says, uh, incise, Stefano 
Ordinano. So I think this means like stamped by or printed by. And I do love our electric green over here on our Spanish tarot. Absolutely beautiful um, colors in this deck. And all three similar with this ribbon coming around. This is tarot made for Herculeo Fournier, Vittoria, España. Uh, this one just says Vergnano, the card maker's name. This one does not have a name, but it's a very elaborately engraved um, image. Uh, the two coins have faces on them, and then um, it looks like an Italian queen of some sort, although I have no idea who that would be. Um, and then this is like a belt with engraving on it. Um, so that's really pretty. Colors again are just killing me. Even this this Fergnano, um, which is more pastel and maybe a little more muted next to this. But look, you've got light blue, you've got light green, red, gold, dark blue. So many different colors. Here the um, coins are beautifully engraved, and even in here you've got purple, blue, gold, and kind of a almost bronze effect with the cross hatching. So they all have really pretty stuff going on. And as we draw to a close on our coins cards, I just want to say thank you for sticking with me on another kind of long and rambling comparison video, but I just love doing this and checking out cards from different time periods that have something in common, whether that's the origination deck that they were based on or regional styles, color palette, whatever it might be. I just like to look and see um, what different card makers decided to do with their stuff. So if you have comments, if you have information on any of these decks that I didn't cover, please give me a shout out below. Um, I'd love to know if any of you have the Nuovo um, and what you think of it. Do you read with it? Um, I have to say the pips are a little bit sparse and so it might be hard for me to, to be motivated to do a reading with it, but um, I do love the face cards, so that's great. Here we have our page of coins, and um, here he seems to be taking a coin out of a treasure chest. Um, here he's outside, and he's got different kinds of foliage in the background. None of them have the duplicate coin that we see sometimes in French decks, so that's interesting. Sometimes they will have one holding, and then one will have a coin on the ground. I don't see that anywhere here. And this guy's clearly outside and it sort of looks like he's out to go mountaineering or something. He's got this all this leather gear on and his satchel with him. Ooh, this is interesting. So we have um, Chinese or um, Middle Eastern influence again on this card with the turban. Um, it's one of the reasons I bought this deck originally was for all the different headgear. We have a big um, kind of Three Musketeers style hat here with the big fluffy feathers. And then here we have our uh, Cavalier in the water on his horse. Um, and he's got a whole suit of armor on, so I really hope he doesn't fall off that horse because he is definitely sinking to the bottom with all that steel on himself. Is our queen of coins again this queen very similar to the others she's inside she's got her cushion under her and her swag behind and this queen doesn't have a lot of scenery but i do love her uh, dress with all the pleats and all the the detail and her simple flower crown really pretty
And finally, our king of coins. And um, here's that duplicate coin I was talking about, except it's on the king and not on the page. So that's interesting in itself. I love the way this guy's um, seat is really heavily decorated. That's super cool. This guy, like his queen, is inside and he's got lots of drapery around him. And then our king of coins is outside. Uh, he's had the, all the treasure from the treasury brought out into the yard so he can play with it. Um, that's very kingly of him. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much again for um, joining me on this little adventure. I hope you enjoyed it at, at least half as much as I did and maybe got something out of it. Um, and I will see you next time for more tarot. Until then, take care.